we're going to begin section two with a tie back to a transcendental theme that we've talked about throughout all of our modules, that of integrated logistics. This time, tying in our definition to ocean import operating models. Integrated logistics is a business discipline through which standalone operational activities are linked together in an effort to increase sales, reduce costs, improve operating efficiencies, rationalize lead times, and optimize inventories. All the things that we've been talking about all along. Ideally designed to tie in both internal and external parties, best practices in integrated logistics also create links between other functional disciplines that by no surprise include sourcing, MRP, purchasing, manufacturing, and sales, thus enhancing the performance of the entire supply chain. Integrated logistics is about bringing together the steps within the logistics function, but also serving as the glue that ties together the cement that ties together the entire supply chain mosaic, if you will. Most often performed by a number of external third parties. Some examples that encompass integrated logistics, of course, PO management, buyer's consolidation, also known as cargo consolidation, main mode of transport, customs clearance, transload, also known as deconsolidation, warehousing and distribution, domestic transportation, kitting and packaging, order fulfillment, last mile, and reverse logistics. Clearly, the most relevant point to be made from this definition is the second paragraph. And how do we use our ocean import operating models to not only accomplish what we spoke of in the first paragraph, but also how to make best use of all these other ancillary services that go on that are part and parcel of ocean transportation. That's the reason why we wanted to bring this back and start off section two with it. Let's start this slide by pointing out its title, Ocean Import Operating Models, but Horizontal and Vertical Integration. How do we use the operating model to help us to achieve what we spoke of in the definition of integrated logistics that we gave just a moment ago? Let's start out by saying that the execution of an ocean import operating model is essentially an exercise in dynamic inventory management. For sure, ocean transportation is about just that, moving goods on the ocean. But our mentality, our philosophy goes beyond that to say that what we're really doing is managing inventory in a dynamic fashion, which is also to say managing goods in transit. When we can transition away, when we can evolve from a transportation mentality, which is really, really important, to a more advanced inventory management mentality, that's when ocean import operating models can reach their full potential. Moving down, optimization of the process itself requires horizontal integration across functions. This has been a transcendental theme, going back to our very first module through sourcing, purchasing, etc. How can we use an ocean import operating model to better integrate demand management, sourcing, purchasing, sales, logistics, finance, etc.? We'll wrap up this slide and state that importers manage the inbound flow of goods in part through the type of ocean import operating model they employ. That's why it's so important. The next two slides are a bit of a reminder because we've said this many, many times. Here, for example, classes of inventory impact which import model will be employed. We said this on the front end of the module itself. This is a listing of the different types of inventories potential inventories in a supply chain, but you will notice that finished goods is highlighted in green because that's the model that we've been using, omni-channel distribution of finished goods. But clearly, not every importer in the United States imports finished goods. We just want to list and reiterate the different types of inventories will drive the type of import model to be used, but restate that in our examples, we have predominantly been talking about finished goods. Conversely, ocean import operating models are also influenced by sourcing and purchasing strategies. Again, we've talked about these strategies multiple times. The one highlighted in green, build to order, is the one that we have most predominantly been using. But it's not the only one. There's built to stock, assemble to order, JIT, VMI, etc. What we're saying is, previous slide, types of inventory matter for the selection of an ocean import operating model as does sourcing, vendor manufacturing, and purchasing strategies. For us, in our examples, built to order. 
based on that introduction, let's start analyzing some ocean import operating models. The first we're going to look at could be considered the most basic, full container load. One of the earliest ocean import models was that of full container load, FCL, where we will have a single vendor producing in quantities sufficient to fill a container, sending goods to a single importer. Second bullet, while there is nothing easy about importing, this model, it can be said, is the least complex of all. Single vendor, full container, single import distribution point. It's not easy, but it's easier. A quick trade tip, goods are oftentimes moved under the clause shippers load and count. This is an FCL term where the container, the ocean container, is spotted at a vendor's factory, loaded by the vendor. The vendor is the only party that sees what goes into the container, and as such, it is referred to as SL and C, shippers load and count, also referred to as STC, said to contain. Something we talked about in Module 6, but we want to bring it up again under the FCL model. The whole idea being that a reference to shipper's load and count on a bill of lading offers limited liability protection to the carrier. Moving along with full container load, not unlike any import model, the relationship between the vendor and importer under FCL is heavily influenced by the Incoterms rule. We've said this dozens of times now. Mercado has a 60-minute complementary training module, training video, on Incoterms, so we don't get into the specific Incoterms in this training program. But we have said a number of times that the Incoterms rules are pretty important. Not only pretty important, really important. And the reason being, to reiterate the point, first and only sub-bullet on this, is that the risk of loss or damage to the goods and division of transportation and customs related costs are driven by, defined by, the chosen Incoterms rule. From X works to delivered duty paid and the many Inco terms in between, any import operating model is going to be heavily influenced by the chosen Inco terms rule. FCL is also influenced by the type of service chosen. Things we've discussed before, but port to port, also known as CY to CY, has its implications for FCL, as does door to port, port to door, and door to door. We're going to look at a number of these and point out the operational considerations that must be held in mind when choosing them. Here's a little visual that portrays what a basic FCL move looks like. S on the left hand side that stands for supplier. Of course we've always used supplier and vendor as synonymous terms in this training but that's what the S stands for. Moving left to right goods are drayed to an origin port, a container yard at an origin port, that's CY, and then they're shipped across the ocean to a port, a port of arrival, a port of discharge in the U.S., or to an inland point of arrival. The important part here, obviously, is the text that we see below this little graphic. And we will see this format as we move forward, so it's kind of important to explain what it means. On the left, we talk about supplier responsibilities. In the middle, we talk about charges to consider. And on the right, just some observations about the model. Let's look at those supplier responsibilities, what they have to do, what the vendor has to do. They're responsible for the booking with the forwarder, hopefully electronically online. That supplier has to prepare commercial documentation. Sure, they have to fill the container, shippers load and count, as we spoke of a moment ago. Inland freight to the port, the supplier has to organize, and of course, export customs clearance. Some of the charges to consider, the division of which is driven by the Incoterms rule, are the following. The BL issuance fee, the charge the forwarder levies for cutting an ocean bill of lading. There could be a container seal fee, the inland freight to the port, the drayage to the port. The supplier will organize that, but depending on the INCO term, they may or may not have to pay for it. There could be some CY monitoring charges, terminal handling, port fees, naturally the export customs clearance fee, the main mode of transport, the ocean freight itself, and any destination charges. Some quick observations on the right-hand side as to the value of full container load models. The supplier has to have enough freight to fill 
a full container. That's the number one consideration. A real advantage to FCL, if the vendor has enough freight, they can ship to one or multiple destinations. Fill containers destined for Portland, Oregon, for Dallas, Texas, for Indianapolis, Indiana. There are multiple types of services that can be used, CY to CY, through bill of lading, etc. Responsibilities, as we said, are heavily influenced by the Incoterms rule used. And we also said a couple of times now, shippers load and count, limits carrier liability. Just some things to think about when contemplating the use of an FCL model. Again, the layout you see here will be consistent as we proceed through the other models. The content will be different, but the layout will be the same. That will be it for section two. And when we come back, we'll continue on with full container load shipping, but CY to CY moves.